This week, my guest is... Tiana Manon. And... John Arnellis. <laughs> and welcome to another show of It's a New Day. Today, we're going to go back and discuss again about young people, the problems that they're faced with, and I thought bringing both of these people together today it will give us a chance to talk about what it is that they're doing, trying to make the connection between young people and basically their responsibility as tomorrow's citizens and governing what's going on in this country. Which one would you like to start and begin to talk about the program? But I'll tell you what, why don't I start with you, John? All right, I can talk a little bit about the genesis of it. Uh, it happened because the, the name of the show is Talk Back for Teens. Uh, and what I do is I go from school to school, high school to high school, giving teens this opportunity to come onto the show where they can talk about the topics that are important to them. So I let them pick the topics. Uh, the reason I started it was because I have three teen boys myself. And um, a few years back, a young 16-year-old girl at my boys' high school broke up with her boyfriend, went home, and took her own life. And it struck me that, you know, what, how, that she didn't have the perspective. She didn't have the connections across generations. It would give her the perspective to step back and say, hey, this is happening today, but it's not the end of my life. It, tomorrow's another day, and if that isn't good enough, then the day after that will be another day. So I kept ruminating on that. What could this young girl have seen that might have got her thinking rationally uh, rather than reacting emotionally? just for those few moments that it would have taken her to get past that low period, you know, that nadir. And uh, then it was a couple of years later that I, that I conceived the idea for uh, putting a show together where teens can not only uh, discuss the topics themselves, but other teens can watch and sort of vicariously see other teens uh, thinking rationally, you know, uh, and decide these these questions for themselves, uh, almost like practicing, you know, if you will, practicing uh, to be rational and to approach things logically, so that when they are confronted with this situation, it doesn't have to be the topic that they're discussing, but any any other discussion, you know, uh, any other topic, that they'll think logically, step by step, rationally. I think he covered the basis of it, okay. and I just. I think it's a good idea to just have a bunch of teens from different aspects, from kind of different backgrounds come together and we can see that this is a common thread among them. So that, I think that also helps teens not feel as alone. How do the two of you interact because of the age difference, the culture difference? How does that mix? Does it work? I'm basically in control and she just helps out. <laughs> uh, no, actually that's one of the strengths I think and she may agree or not agree. but. The fact that we're an inter intergenerational, interracial um, team, right? Cooperation between two people who she always says we're as opposite as you can be. <laughs> so, you know, opposite personalities, we have a few things in common, but opposite personalities, completely different generations, completely different races, yet we commit to being a team because we care and because we're committed to helping teens. How often does your show air? Oh, okay. We tape once a month, um, usually about an hour long, and the Friday or Thursday beforehand, we try to get all of the participants to sit down, and we let them decide a topic so that we don't have anything that's kind of just baked. We kind of, whatever is most prominent in their minds, we let them choose that. And we just, we come together, we usually have a lot of fun, and yeah, it's usually about an hour long. What yeah. is an example of some of the things that you would talk about? Um, I would like to know, since you mentioned suicide, mm -hmm. is teen su suicide something prevalent among young people these days? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid it is. And a lot, uh, a lot of it is coming from uh, the fact that they're so peer-oriented. So now if they're not in the in-group and they're being bullied, and all the technology allows the bullies to you know, come after them on Facebook, come after them in texting, come after them not just in person anymore, but all the time. And so, uh, yeah, the, the rate of teen suicide has gone up, and, it, and the cause of it is more from other teens now than ever before. 
for my understanding, when I was growing up and we had bullies, but it was physical contact that they were at your school, at the centers and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But now this is being done electronically over Facebook. I, I don't understand how that could produce as much fear as physically being confronted with someone. It seems like this Facebook has the same kind of reaction as, as almost of his face to face. Well, that's the funny thing about social media. When we first invented it, we only thought about the good part. Oh, you can talk to your grandma in California. We didn't think about the fact, well, that also brings the bullies closer to home, too. <laughs> um, in regards to, I think, emotional bullying will always have a way worse toll than physical. Like you see, okay. especially when it comes to women, before, I guess, social media, women's bullying was a little bit different than men's. We didn't beat each other up. We stole each other's boyfriends. We <laughs> talked about each other's sweater. That If you've ever seen Mean Girls, it is a perfect example of what emotional bullying can, how it really can take a toll. And I think emotional bullying really shows how much worse it is because a lot of our victims are they're gay or they're you know they're a little bit younger and usually it's because they're being made fun of and I don't know if you heard about the boy in Buffalo when he was he was taunted for being gay and it didn't even end at his suicide when his sister attended a dance they made fun of her for having a gay a gay brother who committed suicide so it's it's the emotional things those last a little bit longer because those scars heal when you get punched in the face but yeah, when you're told you're ugly, that usually lives a little bit longer. And it's instantaneous with this technology. Instantaneous and constant. Yeah. You can't escape it. So now they feel, well, I don't speak for teens, you can. <laughs> but they must feel that they can't escape it. Right. That, that's okay. the, the feeling I get. But once, again, it seems like it ties back into the show that we did, that sense of hopelessness. Um, are young people feeling a lack of self-esteem? The reason why I guess I, I'm, I'm yeah. really harping on this particular point, <laughs> now, <laughs> this is going to really make me seem very old. Oh, gosh. Now, Not to me. It can't be worse than the disco. Oh, yeah, this is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> now, because we didn't have Facebook when we were growing up, but we had what were called slam books. Yes, I know. I had a slam book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you nice. would write people's names in there and stuff, mm -hmm. and people would comment on... It was in a public place, right? So Yes, yeah, so could, people could yeah. read them. And, yeah, cool. well, because I was a bad guy, <laughs> I mean, many times what they would write about me would be very negative things, but I, I really didn't care. Mm -hmm. And because I had a different image of myself. Where I'm noticing now, it seems like people are seem to be more sensitive and really take this stuff closer to heart now. And it, it really, truly impacts them. Mm -hmm. Well, there's something I could say about that, unless you... No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I believe that it's because the uh, the the family structure is broken down. Everything's coming at families, they're breaking up like never before. You know, the divorce rate is one thing. It's over 50%. But then you have the family courts exacerbating that, pitting one parent against the other at a time when they're not, you know, thinking clearly. They're thinking very emotionally and reacting very emotionally towards each other and not really putting the children first. So, mm. uh, you know, my take is always that children have one family whether it's split up over two households now or not because of divorce, they still have one family. To that child, they have their parents, and they think of themselves as a unit, uh, you know, just one that's not functioning in the same household. So if you pit them one household against the other, the child loses every time. And uh, I think with the destruction of the family, children aren't getting that foundation, that emotional foundation about themselves, the self-esteem, the they should be getting from a home. And so now when they're bullied, they don't have the reserves. They don't have a parent they, they can go to who's been building them up 
to the point where they, you know, in a believable way, where they can sustain themselves against bullying and other kinds of attacks. Do you agree with that? Um, I think it's a great point, but I'd like to point out that teens will never go to their parents. They, we will never, ever, probably ever go to our parents on stuff like that. I know me, when I had issues in middle school, I didn't go to my mom, and me and my mom were very, very cool. I think if what especially lends a big hand to this is the fact that we look so much more to society. If you look on television, music, right now, if you are not light-skinned with long hair, with a big booty, you are not pretty. And so if everyone is, is learning from TV what's beautiful and we're no longer focusing on substance like intellect or you, are you, can you get through obstacles, if we're only focusing on looks, that's what anyone else is going to focus on. And so when you learn who you should be from something as shallow as that, and that's all you aim for, when someone takes that from you, and you have nothing else to fall back on, then you have this horrible issue that we're facing right now. I, I, I want to come to that point. We have evolved back to that? Yes. You have to be light-skinned. You got to be light-skinned. This is... If you watch rap videos, there a lot of the girls are light-skinned. They're long hair, big, big booties. It's, yeah, and that's usually what guys go after right now. And you actually hear it a lot in schools that they make fun of each other for being too dark-skinned. We have just really lost our sense of pride. Mm -hmm. we, we've lost them. I, I guess they've never heard James Brown sing, <laughs> say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> mm -hmm. What are some of the other issues that young people are faced with? Well, um, I've learned something. Every time I get one of these groups of teens together, um, I learned something that wasn't obvious to me. You know, kind of like the first time you interviewed Tiana, it's like there are things that you just weren't aware of. We as adults just aren't aware of. The very first uh, episode that we did, on, or that I did on the, on the teen show, because I produced the show and Tiana hadn't joined it yet, was, uh, was on bullying. And that's the only topic that I've picked myself because it was the first show. And everybody, when I wanted to put the show together, I said, well, I want the teens to pick it. And people were kind of pressuring me saying, Bullying, it's real hot right now. You should ask them about bullying. Well, it's certainly a topic teens can talk about because it affects them. But um, on the first show, I had three young teen girls. Um, they were, one was a senior, 17, 16, and 15. And the two older girls, to my surprise, had been bullies. It floored me. And so what I, you know, what I asked them was, what were you feeling when you were bullying? You know, why did you do it? Why did you get involved in it? And what came out was that they, uh, that they, what they were feeling was just relief. They weren't empathizing for that person being bullied now. They're just relieved that it wasn't them, that they weren't the target. And so it w really wasn't until after the incident was all over that they were able to stop, think about it, and then feel bad. So they didn't get to the empathy until after the fact. Well, that's the basic principles of bullying. Most bullies are cowards, mm -hmm. and what it is is to keep things off of them. They may have a little bit more nerve than the next person, so it's easier for them to challenge or confront someone and make themselves appear to be rather tough, so uh, it keeps the heat off of them. So, you know, that, yeah. that's something that is understandable, but. Now, one of the things that I have been finding to be really shocking when it comes to bullying is that there are more women, more young um, females that are participating in violence. I, I mean, I, I just can't believe that now we have evolved to a state where at, once, at one time it was just guys because we were releasing testosterone. We, we thought this would get the girls if we appeared to be tough. But now the young women are just as violent and just as quick to fight. Not just another woman, but a, a guy as well. There's actually a story. I don't. I think it happened this week. It was a group of girls from one of the public schools, and. We don't know why, but they were just walking downtown, decided they wanted to fight, and they chose this older woman. Some people are saying, I don't think they beat her to death. Some people are saying that, but they, apparently they like beat her unconscious or something. Mm. They didn't rob her. She didn't have money anyway. They didn't like steal from her. They just beat her up. 
and you, you hear it all the time. I went to a self-defense class a while ago, me and my mom, and it was a police officer there. He used to work in um, RCSD too. He said he would break up a guy's fight any time of the day, but when two women are fighting, you do not want to get in the middle of that. Get sliced up. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's really interesting. What about sexuality? About this has been down through the ages. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I know that some people really are upset because starting at uh, high school levels, and I guess maybe some middle schools as well, have started passing out condoms, which has caused a tremendous right. uproar. But the reality is, is that young people are going to experiment. Mm -hmm. And if they are going to experiment, at least they need to be safe because of the sexually transmitted diseases now, unwanted pregnancies. That's how yeah. I was introduced. Oh, okay. <laughs> the first show she was on was on teen pregnancy, that's right. Yeah, I was part of the group that spearheaded that effort, Safe Sex Inc. It's a youth group in the community. And I remember when we drafted the policy, we didn't think the condom policy would be the thing that set people off because there are three other main points. And one of the main points is to have community agencies come in and teach about lesbian and gay sexuality too instead of just keeping it heterosexual. Okay. And we thought that would be the thing to set the community off and say, no, we can't let them teach about gay sex in our schools. So Not when people even. were like going crazy about condoms, we were like, why are they we didn't understand because they're not just going to be sitting in a bowl in the middle of the bathroom. You have to go to like a mints. nurse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to go to a nurse. You have to, she has to speak to you about what you're doing and then she gives it to you. It's not like she just willy nilly hands it out. So I think for us, we were just so shocked to see how much backlash it has gotten. And even when it was passed, to see how many community organizations are now coming together to continue fighting it. So I think, I think it's very, no one ever expected that to be the big thing. And yeah, teens are going to experiment. And I mean, when you have two generations of young parenting, because the big one was in the 90s, and now we're back 16, 18 years later, we're back at that age. So this was the perfect time to make, to start a movement like this, to try and counteract what could happen again. And I think it's just interesting to see so many people want to fight that when they say school and now everyone wants to be a parent when the school is trying to take over their job but when they want teachers to feed them oh why aren't you teaching my kid and but when it comes to sex now they want to take over their job again it's very interesting would you like to come on that well just that uh, that that episode on teen pregnancy uh, there are a few things that did come up that weren't obvious uh, to me anyway the boys were talking about, I don't know if you remember this, but the boys were talking about how um, it used to be in my day, maybe in our day, the, uh, that women would trap men by getting pregnant. Well, now the boys were saying, you know, some of these guys, they want to get somebody pregnant. It's, it's, mm -hmm. It goes to their rep. You know, I got this beautiful woman pregnant, and now she's got to be, you know, my bad, baby mama. Bad, not beautiful. It's bad. It's bad. And... So, <laughs> and uh, I'm using general terms so every generation can understand. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that wasn't obvious to me, that the guys are, you know, what used to be getting them into a trap, no, they're, now they're trapping the women, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's out of control when you've got both sexes basically using each other for their own, you know, to make themselves look good or feel good. Or, and we actually found out when doing the movement that a good portion of high school students who were actually sexually active didn't know how to put on a condom in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's like not only did they not fully understand what could happen, a lot of them didn't even know that it only takes like one little fishy sperm to knock you up. They thought it would take like a little bit more or something like that. Unless you're trying to get pregnant. Yeah, it, it was so interesting to really yeah. see how much they didn't know and trying to figure out how in a policy without kind of uh, like making the parents angry. How do we still educate our students? So it was actually really hard coming up with that policy. And of course, I was the only one who brought up the whole idea of uh, abstinence. Tiana was the only one who even 
Yeah, Back abs a lot of that. people don't realize that too. The um, policy isn't just um, we're going to get rid of abstinence. We're keeping that still on the table. We just want to teach about other methods. Of course, yeah. Right. So it was. It's and very giving out condoms is an opportunity to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, they're getting them off the street or wherever they can get them. No, they're not getting them anywhere. Yeah, Nobody the wants to go to the pharmacy yeah. and see, like, this is actually said to me. That white guy up at the counter who's looking at me with his judgmental eyes while I buy condoms. So it's like, we right. don't want to send them there. They're feeling There's all like these mixed that. messages. Don't well, get them. Nothing boy. else. That has transcended <laughs> down through the ages yeah. because when we were kids, we didn't want to be looked at going in the right. store and buying Trojans as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I want to talk about education. Um, do you talk well, about education? We've talked on the about program? gangs. We've talked about school. We did one. One uh, group was on school. And good and teachers. We did one on teachers. That's right. I forgot about that. She was involved in the teachers one. The one on school, though, it opened my eyes uh, as to how busy these students are. The ones that are achieving, the ones that are making it, I don't know how they do it because they're balancing their sports. They're balancing the time commitments and all their extracurricular stuff, how do they ever get to their academics? How do they keep that on track? So they're admitting to me that, well, I stay up all night, I don't get enough sleep, you know, I'm cutting out my sleep. Well, this is, sounds like what we used to do in college. Well, now the teens are doing it. If you want to achieve even in high school, mm -hmm. you're burning yourself out because if you don't have on your app to college that I was in sports and I did all this other stuff too, in addition to good grades, it's not enough. I remember for my college application, I had a senior project, an internship, a part-time job, and I had a full course load, and I still managed to get a very high three, like just under a four GPA, and it's still, they, RIT was just like, this is barely enough. They, they didn't yeah. want to give me a lot of financial aid. It was just interesting to see what you have to do to get into college now. Yeah, the... Uh the student achievers, there's so much pressure now on the top students like Tiana, like my boys. The, what's that laugh about? <laughs> the, uh, the, the top achievers, um, there's so many constituents now who, who benefit from them doing well, mm -hmm. you know, to make them look good. So I see the way I, from my perspective as a parent, from someone who's been around, um, and I'm also an educator, um, it seems to me that those poor kids have so much dumped on their shoulders, the ones who are achieving, because the, the, the sea of over, uh, underachievers has grown. So now the focus on those top achievers is just tremendous. I'd like to point out, though, as a top achiever, I felt there was no focus at all in Rochester City School District. Um, I, I felt like the whole curriculum is just dumbed down because mm. we're so, there are so many lower performing students and now that we have this whole you can only get a regents diploma to graduate the regents seems a little bit easier to do and the whole idea that now they're teaching to a test and I remember for one of my regents classes there were at the time I had the older regents the English regents and it was four main essays and I remember that was all we did that whole class was four essays and we took about 10 weeks just to focus on that one essay. And I know my mom who teaches the English Regents class, that's pretty much in those classes, that's all you learn. And so you see a lot less focus on critical thinking skills and just how to, how to apply the words that you are learning further than a task for essay. And I think, and so a while ago actually, when I was at college and a few of, I, I luckily did very well my first quarter, but I saw a lot of students from RCSD struggle. So I emailed the superintendent and I wanted to know why, what's going on? Like, what do you have in place to motivate students? If you're so focused on the lower performing students, what motivation do they have to get past that if everything is for them already? And when I ended up talking to Mary Doyle and she, she told me they have a few programs, but everything is pretty much targeted to lower performing students. And so if there, uh, what was that statistic? I don't know if you guys know, but mm. it's like less than 50% of students are actually ready for college when they graduate. Exactly. It's really, really bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's I much think, less. Yeah. I, I just find um, this whole thing to be just truly amazing. But now you can also see why it would make students feel, why even try? Mm -hmm. Okay, there are just students that are just saying, why even go through this? Because 
um, this is more than I, I want to do. And if they're not being encouraged by family, people in the community, um, this really takes them even further and further away from the process. I think they're asked to do more and more with less and less foundation. They're not given the foundation for it. So no wonder they, they opt out. They just say, hey, this isn't reality. This is less and less connected to reality. Why, why engage with this? A lot of times you have to take care of your family, too. I know, I know a lot of students who couldn't apply themselves to school like they wanted to because they had to work full-time or part-time jobs to supplement their mom's salary or her benefits sometimes. So I think a lot of times you're, you're pulled too many ways, whereas like top achievers like I, I chose what I wanted to do. Belly dancing for my senior project, that's a, that's a lot easier. And interning, a lot of times I was able to do my homework at my internship. But when you're working part-time jobs and then you also have to take care of your little brothers and sisters, you don't have the time that you need or the focus that you need because you're losing out on sleep to do well in school. But what about drugs? When I was growing up, we were in the drug culture. This is, I guess, our generation is really what brought drugs to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And what about this young culture? Are, are drugs just as prevalent? Um, yeah, I think they're more and more in the suburbs, too. And we haven't dealt with that as a topic because the teens haven't chosen that as a topic. I think that's going to be hard how, to get them to talk yeah, about. Yeah, that, that's so. something they're not going to really want to talk on camera. Is there a reason about. why? Well, it's illegal. Well, especially yeah. now. With <laughs> it's the, illegal with, to get in it's trouble. It's illegal. With the, <laughs> but, 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 They've been um, scooting under the radar. This and is their parents put them right may the not know and oh, okay. stuff like that. So yeah. they Unless we fuzz out their faces. But, but now, they, what about with the decriminalization of marijuana? I mean, now you can walk around which small amounts of marijuana on you and it's no big deal. I mean, it's to the point now when you go downtown because you see it's been decriminalized. It's I mean, everywhere. you're just seeing people smoking right there. They're oh, rolling yeah. up right there. No one is running when they see the police anymore. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, so this is a subject they won't readily talk about. No. I know a lot yeah. of people, though, who do sell drugs not because they like to but once again to help their parents out and they realize shorter hours more money it's a it's a lot easier than working in an actual established job so in regards to selling that's usually why but when you do is a lot of people the people i know aren't like high achievers like and then they smoke it it's usually like why am i even doing this the the one person i know who is the youngest smoking and doing it the most and all of that stuff is actually the most hopeless person also that I know who doesn't apply himself at school, who has a very, very rocky home life. He's actually allowed to smoke with his mother, which yeah. that, that just boggles my mind. <laughs> but, and I've noticed that she's very hopeless too. She doesn't, she has a few other kids. She doesn't make them try as hard in school. She doesn't visit their schools when they get in trouble. And she kind of just lets them fall to the wayside. Would you happen to know how old or ballpark range of how old his mother is? She had him very young. So she's maybe about 16 years older than him. Okay. So maybe barely 30s. Wow, it's that culture of hopelessness that mm -hmm. is, is so frightening. Young people, the sea of hopeless young people. Well, you can see a top achiever like Tiana, there are times where it gets to you. Oh yeah, right? yeah. My older, my boys too, and they're they're in the top six percent academically. But know, I think it's just because no one celebrates what we're doing. It's like you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and well, waiting okay. for. What about to the say schools something. that pat you on the back? You know that whole self-esteem thing through those first twelve years. Well, Why doesn't that work as a pat on the back? Because but they're not patting. They're, the they're, 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 I agree with that. They're, I don't think that they celebrate this enough. Right. And, and not only do they not celebrate it enough. They don't hold these people up as shining examples of what could be. We pay more attention to the students that get in trouble, right. yeah. that are failing. A few years ago, with the book that I wrote, they bought X number amount of books. The vast majority of the books were sent to the reform school yeah. and they got the books and the students that were achievers, 
yeah. could use this to, be, to go even further, to become even greater examples, received yeah. absolutely nothing. And that's one of the things that I think that is wrong. We are not giving enough people example or young people enough examples of success. For the most part, they have no idea of what success looks like. Like you're saying with your friend, this young person has no idea. And the best as he or she looks at you as maybe you're different. All right. Okay, somehow there's something happening, a guardian angel, whatever it is that they want to say to justify for your success and their failure. And I mm -hmm. think that that's where I come back now to this generation. I mean, you guys have no heroes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, there... There are no role models. There, anymore. There's no they are one... They celebrities. Who uh, um, the rallying the cause for young people, whatever that may be. And, yeah. and I think that there are several causes. Um, these ridiculous wars that they continue to send young people off to. Okay, uh, uh, the economy, th that should be, I mean, I I'm thinking young people should be up in arms. Because uh, that's uh, their future. Exactly. I am, I'm up in arms about it. Five people who are up in arms. Sure. I'm looking at yeah. uh, uh, employment, mm -hmm. okay, uh, uh, entrepreneurship. The I health of the planet. I've, exactly. Yeah. The food that we eat, the water that we eat. Um, exactly. I mean, don't even get me going. Yeah. I mean, I got exactly. a whole right lot the air of that things. We breathe. And oh. I'm looking at young people not taking up any of these causes. And I believe what the reason why a lot of it, 99% of it comes back on, on us as adults. We aren't doing anything. We are not doing anything that hardly represents anything really glorious anymore. But now I think that young people are going to have to take reins to, to pull this and bring this to a stop. I mean, just like how you're saying now that now all of a sudden we have reverted back to light-skinned people <laughs> being, I mean, that mm -hmm. was, we've got rid of that in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And now it it's has bad. resurfaced itself yeah. again. I think that these are issues that we have to start really looking at. And, and I think there comes a responsibility. Those of us that have the ability to see this, I think we have to put a cape on. I, I think we, we've got to become cape crusaders. We've got to take the challenge and start moving this stuff along because, well, this is what got us to where we are. If Rosa Parks had never sat down in that seat on that bus, there's no telling where we would be. If they had never marched through the South the way that they did, who knows where we would be. Taking it even further, if America, if Americans had never thrown that tea into the harbor, <laughs> But where do those heroes come from? Where do those leaders come from? In those teen years, from about 15 to 25, are where people are the most energetic and the most, I mean, for generations, those have been where the leaders come from. They come out of that. Now, they may not step up into the light at that age. Rosa Parks was much older. But, but I'm just saying that, that is where the core of activism comes from, is that 15 to 25-year range. Nothing is going to happen, though, until we get fed anymore. up. I mean, exactly. right, um, the people who threw the tea away, they didn't want any more taxes. Rosa Parks was tired of everything that was going on. And I think right now, I don't want to, uh, it sounds kind of counterintuitive to say that youth, we kind of have it easy because in a roundabout way, more we're expected to do more for our families. We have to do this, we have to do that. But in other areas of our life, Everything is so lax that we can just kind of scoot on by. School, we're not expected to do very well. We're not expected to hold high up jobs. We're not expected to go out into the community and mentor each other. So we like to say, oh, it's so much harder on us because we're living in poverty. But in other aspects of our lives, 
we're not expect we're not expected to do anything because of this poverty because they're going to say oh they don't have as many opportunities as us because they can't do this so until you realize that this is what's going on they're saying that we cannot do this because we're poor or our schools suck until they realize that they're pretty much being just kind of tossed away by society then they're just going to take whatever is given to them and take that easy life they're given a lot of excuses mm -hmm. So it's easy and that to makes it way it. easier. And they're yeah. not. I mean, when you're giving an, an easier life and you consider your life to be so much harder, you're gonna take that easier life. You're gonna say, "Oh, I deserve this. E I deserve this. I deserve not to do well in high school and not have crazy expectations on me." So they're gonna take that. And until they realize that they're actually helping other people imprison themselves. I, when I did a, my last Have a Smiley event, and he told me that when you are poor as a youth, you will most likely remain poor throughout your entire life. And then he went on to say that doesn't have to happen. Until people realize that this doesn't have to happen, we're going to continue to imprison ourselves. How does that process begin? Where does it begin? Well, it's a good lateral into the success side that, uh, of our website that Tiana is working on. Okay, tell us about the website. Well, you can start with the articles, too. I think, I think you mentioned that stuff before, though. Oh, it's just uh, I've been writing a few pieces about what I've noticed in youth a lot of times. Um, personal stories that I hear from other students, teachers, just about Rochester youth. And I also wrote an article about the condom policy, which was actually very fun to write <laughs> hearing the opposing yeah. views. But um, what I was trying to do is incorporate other youth's writings to get their perspective because I didn't necessarily come from poverty. So even though I dealt with its effects in an impoverished school district, I, want, I wasn't in it 24-7. So to get other youths who've come from different backgrounds and also I kind of want to impose expectations on the website. Like, I don't want to be like everyone else and say, it's fine if you just live your lives. And so I want to put a standard on there and showcase great work by students in RCSD and show that this should be the bar that you are hoping to attain and do that kind of thing. And we want it to not just show the success, be a place where they can go and be celebrated by other teens, but also a, a place where they can go and be supported their successes can be supported. So for instance, uh, with, we're looking into a way to uh, be able to have a chip in or a kickstart on there where teens, if they, if they log in there and they like somebody's artwork or they like somebody's um, other success story, it could be academic, it could be sports, it could be artwork, any, anything, you know, that's up to them. Um, they could kick in a dollar, they could kick in a dollar to the things that they like and if enough students like it, that student will get that, you know, into their PayPal account. But in other ways, you want to support them, too. Do young people have strong support systems? I, I mean, there was a time that maybe a teacher, uh, maybe there was a counselor at a center somewhere, or, or your parents, or even faith-based. Um, do young people have support systems? Are there... Uh, I know that my niece was mentoring a young girl, and she had no support system. There was no one that she could turn to. I mean, absolutely not one person. Is this prevalent like that? Yeah, I mean, you take out the main support system of your parents, which is a lot more prevalent today. Teachers have so much more on their shoulders than ever before, dealing with a failing district, and then counselors mm -hmm who recognize how much more it's taking to get into college, trying to prepare and help students put their best foot forward. I know my counselor who was amazing. Like she found scholarships for us. She would set up little events to help us, you know, do this. And so as a result, she may not have had as much time to hear about personal stories and do all of that because she was so making sure that we were set up academically that it, I don't want to say she didn't have any time, but she didn't have as much time for emotional issues. And so, no, I guess we it's not as much as before as you guys had. I think that's at the heart of the problem is they don't have any of the support systems that they should have, that they used to have. I just think that, once again, I, 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 I just feel that we need to have some voice. We, we need a voice 
that is talking about these things, that, that is bringing this to the forefront. I think that your show, your website, what you're doing, I think that this should have a stronger presence. We need to be able to get these ideas, these concepts, more than anything, this idea of self-esteem, getting young people to feel a sense of worth of themselves. One of the beauties of the 60s, besides getting high, <laughs> because as I, I said, that, 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 was, uh, that those, uh, we grew up in, in the beginning of a drug culture. But one of the beautiful things about the 60s is that we were coming out of this air, if you will, of ignorance. And we were starting to feeling really good about ourselves. We had this sense of pride. Um, we, we, we no longer felt downtrodden. Now, our financial status had not changed, <laughs> but inside of us had changed. We grew these afros, we were wearing dashikis, we took on these African names, but it gave us a sense of worth. Mm -hmm. For the first time, I can personally remember um, sitting in school and I would excel in everything until it came to history. Because now when it came to history, the only part of history that they had about black people was that somehow, which they weren't even sure, that somehow we came from Africa, okay? And then we just started picking cotton, okay? And that was it. And I would be so embarrassed because now we're hearing about how Rome developed this civilization, how Greek started uh, from nothing. And then you go into England, France, and all of European history, and then into American history. And there was nothing. And especially at that time, we were labeled as Negroes, and there was no country in the world called Negro or Negro land. So we were totally lost, confused. But in the 60s, we became aware of this identity, um, the idea of being proud and feeling beautiful because you were black. Prior to the 60s, you better not call a, a, a black person black. That was a fist fight. But then in the 60s, we took this on with such pride. And now we have now evolved back to where if you're light-skinned, you're somehow better. I, I just think that when I talk about causes, that's a cause. Anything that I believe that entraps you, that enslaves you, that makes you feel less than what you are is a cause. And for me, that cause is worth fighting. Mm -hmm. When I got myself in trouble when I was in Attica and during the riot there, now we had no idea the end results that they were going to do what they did, but we were prepared to deal with the consequences rather than to continue to live like that. And I think that if we don't have young people feeling like that, now we need to start making them feel the pressures because what's going to happen to them when they become adults? One of my biggest questions that I continue to ask last year, 53.9% of the students in the Rochester City School District failed. Mm -hmm. How does the city of Rochester absorb this group of people into its economy? Because these people aren't, aren't going to get jobs. Right. Okay. Yeah. How many of them will actually go on further and get a GED and further themselves and go into college? The vast majority of them are going to be consumed in the handouts and helplessness. They're going to be a drag on the community, not a help on the community. And these are issues that I think that we need to be addressing. Mm -hmm. And then because they're going to have children. And if this 53.9% failed, then that means 
53.9% of their offspring is going to fail, if, the, if not, the, more. If not yeah. more. So how does your program now, we talked about the problems and the doom and the gloom. How do we now bring some hope? How does your website, how does your show bring hope into people's lives? Well, like I said, the, we're, they're, Tiana took over the uh, website. The shows themselves are designed to uh, give teens a forum to talk about what they want to talk about, not what adults think they should be talking about, but what they want to talk about. As much as I'd love to steer it towards topics that I'd love to hear about, it's really there for them, so they choose it. Um, and that's a way for other teens to watch and uh, become, an, you know, hear, hear the discussion, but also go to the website, start a thread, join a thread, talk about that topic. Um, you know, become part of that discussion. And then if we revisit that topic on another, you know, in a future date, I will use that discussion from online, incorporate that as a starting point in the discussion again, you know, the next show that deals with that topic. I think that maybe we should be taking a little more aggressive approach and having topics. Because I think that if we can begin to engage some of these people in some of these topics, and I think that perhaps maybe that's what it is. I think perhaps maybe we're all sitting around waiting for each other. The only thing about that is if you tell them to talk about something, then it's not something they want to talk about. They're not going to talk okay, about it. Okay, and I can mm -hmm. appreciate that. Right. I can, and I and, can accept that. Mm -hmm, and that, that's a really big issue is that youth are so focused on wanting to become independent people, wanting to become independent thinkers and adults that they feel like they should be able to make their own decisions. And especially coming from another adult, trying to push them into something else, they're going to just push harder back. And so you're not going to get the results that you are looking for, if any at all. But that's why I, once again, when, if you want to become an independent uh, thinker, George Washington Carver said, if you want to make a person responsible, you have to give them responsibility. And that's what we have to do. We've got to give people responsibility. We've got to make them become independent thinkers. We've got to give them the opportunity to push the envelope life isn't easy and this idea this concept of thinking that you're going to float through life mm -hmm. that's not reality whatsoever you're going life is going to confront you right. okay and if you're not prepared to be confronted if you're not prepared to handle challenges then what you see what the end results of this more teenage pregnancies, more unwanted children, mm -hmm. increased poverty, increased ignorance. And I think that we have somehow took away the rod and spoiled the child <laughs> to, to, a, to a large degree. And I think that in today's world, we've got many, many, many more tools to work with. I think that we can find a way to interact and to begin a level of communication. I think the biggest part is, is that we, the older the group of people versus the younger group of people, I believe we have made that division. I think we are the ones who have made this big gap and we're looking at each other through these different eyes. When I think that what it really needs is for us to be doing just like what we're doing now. I yeah. think, and, and then and, and it's also being able to incorporate and use young people like yourself. And once again, I strongly believe that if we held you up to a higher standard, for instance, you're going to Tavis Smart, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. I, I've been trying to get on, <laughs> on Tavis Smiley's show. He won't even respond to me. I think that what you're doing is fantastic. And, and this is what we should be holding out here. What you did with um, Cornell West, Cornell West the, the way that you got that interview, that is outstanding. 
the things that you are doing mm -hmm. with your life. It that is isn't luck, young lady. That was work. It's truly outstanding. And what we have got to be able to do, I believe, because young people are competitive like anybody other group of people are competitive. And I believe we all want to be complimented. I believe we all want to be patted on the back. What has happened is that because they don't see a direct benefit mm -hmm. from what is happening in your life. They also see the hypocrisy behind it. That's what I was getting at when I say it. All through those grade years, they're, they're talking about self-esteem. They're patting the kids on the back. But what we, the kids quickly realize how hollow it is. And my kid goes to his, uh, he rarely goes to his honor roll breakfast because. Or they expect it for the rest of their lives. I know like one time my mom was teaching a class and I think one of the students expected candy for a right answer. Yeah. And I, I mean, you get so expectant on incentives and that's not, that's not the way the world works. It's not so immediate. What we need to do is celebrate it and support it at the same time. Then they realize that it's real. What you're, what you're saying is real. We're going to support but what you're doing. I, I think sometimes we over celebrate it. Like for instance, when a child graduates from kindergarten, I mean, that's not a party, <laughs> yeah. okay? And, and you know, those are the things that, that we go overboard with. And I think that we miss the boat on the things that we should be celebrating. And I truly believe that we have, we do young people a tremendous disservice when we don't recognize the good that they do. I also, and speaking as well to adults, we've got to find a better way of us being better people. Because I put the, the large blame of this on us because we have dropped the ball. Um, we develop these ideas in our heads. We think because now we've raised our kids that now this is no longer our problem anymore because we don't have kids in school. Um, our kids, are, yeah, we don't have to care anymore. And as a result of that, this is further disconnecting us. I went to um, an event one Saturday, and what it was for, it was for parents and students. Nobody came. I mean, no one came. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, 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 and then, uh, one person that was there was the grandmother because her daughter wouldn't come with the student. Now, the student didn't come. The student or the daughter didn't Just come. Just the grandmother. Just the grandmother came. And that's what I'm talking about, this disconnect that we have. Like parent-teacher conferences, yes. all of those are hilarious. I used to go with my mom, and we would just sit there for hours waiting for parents to come in. I think actually Wednesday was Freddie Thomas's um, parent-teacher conferences, and it's it's just well known for teachers to not expect anyone to come. Just parents aren't mm -hmm. as interested in how their students are doing and can't be bothered. It's like. Especially even at my school, it just it was a little bit bigger school without walls, boop boop. But it just it still wasn't a really big event that a lot of parents came to. It's the same way in the suburbs too. I'm rare, you know I'm usually the only parent, or there might be one, two others. And and also even from uh, on the sports side, I, I notice. I'll put it this way. Anyway, I notice black parents don't come out and support their children. Even when it comes to sports, there's not that used enough. Used to be the one place that they were supported. Exactly, sports. and now there's. I was in Mississippi uh, promoting my book, and I went to a track meet there. And when you look around, there weren't that many parents or families supporting these young people participate, and, and they're playing their hearts out. Mm -hmm. hmm. And once again, I just think that this is such a disconnect and we've got to get back into this sense of community. We've got to start realizing that just because this isn't your biological child, this is still a member of your community. Right. This yeah. is still someone that you still have to be responsible to and for. You have a stake in it. It's your future. Exactly. Because we are seeing the results 
of us not having a stake in this. And as a result of this, uh, we're seeing that everything is just falling apart. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've got to come at this totally different. Give us some ideas of some more uh, of what you can do or what we can do to help promote the website, how we can get more young people involved into what you're doing. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. why don't you give us the website address? Shoot, young lady. It's talkbackforteens.com. <laughs> Talkback for Teens with the four. A number four, Tiger number 14. Four. What um, about we're your cool blog? like that. What about your blog? The blog is on the website. Um, yeah. We set up the website so that you're able to see both the episodes and articles that are written. And I've set up a little slideshow feature where the newest stuff is compiled right there. It's just You don't have to go searching all over the website. It's the, it's the first thing you see. Okay. And really, my foundation is that the generations have to start engaging again and stop. We have so many divisions these days, you know, it's race. It's not even just race, it's how light or how dark your skin is. The sex, you know, the gender is, is a separation now. Everything is a division. Generations don't even talk to each other. They wouldn't even think of being engaged with each other. You know, the parents are afraid of their own children. Children, you know, their parents don't even exist for them. or They're not involved with them. And that, that's got to change. We've got to start caring about each other and, and engaging with each other again. Yes, we do. Once again, thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you. And I'm certainly hoping that we can really begin a stronger dialogue uh, within the community and start really looking at these issues and stop thinking that somehow they're just going to disappear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.